So hello everyone, welcome to the lockdown video cast slash podcast. Um, I'm here with Adit Chabedi, who's the co-founder and COO of Lingumi. Good morning, Adit. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> How are you doing, mate? I'm all right, man. Things are good. Things are yeah. good. On, on a personal level, how have you been during lockdown? <laughs> so at the beginning, we're struggling a little bit. Yeah. Because I'm quite outgoing and I get energy off people. Mm. I think I've adapted to the situations, or at least have tried to. Mm. Uh, and now it's not bad. Although having not to go out is quite hard. And so to help resolve that, yeah. I decided to buy an Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? <laughs> I swear to God. Just to like shut off. So I um I was like, oh shit, man, I'm not really going out. What do I even do? Yeah. So I was like, oh, I really wanted to buy a switch, but everywhere I looked online, I was like, oh man, switches are all sold out. So I was like, fuck it, I'll get an Xbox. <laughs> get an Xbox. And, uh, yeah, I played, love that. Played Crash Bandicoot and now I'm on now I'm on Assassin's Creed. So. Really? All, <laughs> all the classics. I love that. I was, that, I was actually going to ask, okay, so apart from playing the Xbox, like, what have you been doing, obviously, outside of work to, like, keep yourself stimulated? Because I know a lot of people at the moment are talking about the fact that, so for, so for me, for example, I've been, like, running more, and, like, that's really, really helped because it's gave me something to focus on. So, like, what, what have you been, like, trying to focus on during lockdown? Mm. Good question. So, what have I been doing? Uh, Spending a bit more time with family. Yeah, nice. Uh, often I'm out so much, but I don't really spend time with my, my mum or dad. And mm. yeah, they kind of missed a lot of it. So I was like, this is an opportunity for me to spend more time with them and reconnect with my mum. Mm. I think oftentimes during the business, I got so latched in mm. and then so caught up in it that I just, my mind was never really here for years. Was either at work or chilling with friends, and so now is the opportunity for us to really reconnect. Uh, I've been playing Xbox, like I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been doing fitness, but I'm not going to lie to you; it's not as disciplined as I would have liked it to have been. Okay. I did. I set a goal. I was like, it's completely. I, I was super unfit. Mm. So I was like, ah. Oh, I'm going to set myself a little 10K challenge. And then within two weeks, I ran a, I ran a 10K. Not a good time. It was like 57 minutes or something. Oh, really? And, okay. And then I was like, then it kind of hit the slump again. So I'm not really good at finding consistent ways to shut off from work. But mm. uh, it's going to sound cliche, but I love what I do. And so mm. whether that's reading new books. So right now I'm reading... Uh, <clears throat> the Great Mental Models by Farnham Street. Okay. And it's all about how do you make better decisions through the lens of physics, chemistry, and biology, for example. And so, mm. Mm. you know, the concept of relativity in, mm. for us in terms of mental models, it means always get different perceptions and views of things from different people because mm. you're very narrow minded in what you see. Uh, the concept of, I'm going to say this wrong, but recipro it's reciprocal basically mm. uh, i think it's called reciprocity anyways what it, it, reciprocal so mm -hmm. being able to give to then get so you know if you if i let off good energy to the things i do and make a difference to other people then that energy comes back and so mm. yeah i've just been trying to study different mental models uh what else have i been reading i've been reading uh I read a book by Patty McCord called Powerful on Culture. Powerful, okay. Um, rare, uh, just been reading different books on people, culture, and uh, how we go about uh, scaling businesses, really. Mm. 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 Nice, nice. Well, it sounds like you've actually got a good routine and you're doing lots of cool stuff. So. <laughs> and I think lots of people watching this will, will have a takeaway that I think it's important to not be unrealistic about things like fitness. Like, don't, don't just do it because everyone else is doing it, but clearly, like, reading books, buy an Xbox, you know, do what you need to do to, to get through this time. So no, yeah. that's, uh, I, I appreciate those, uh, those thoughts. So, okay, let's jump in. So studied, obviously, after finishing um, after school, um, 
computer science at UCL. Had you always known that you were going to do ComSci uh, at UCL, or did you kind no of? Way, that? <laughs> no way, No uh, way. In school, you know, the first few years are interesting. I've got bullied quite a lot. Um, okay. I wasn't achieving good grades. Mm. Uh, I was bunking off school here and there. And it wasn't until year 10 where I started getting my act together. Uh, and a teacher, I, I did something in a room and the teacher was like, one of my closest teachers, he passed away about four or five years ago. But, you know, he brought me in and he was like, look, either you're going to get completely out of this school or you're going to sit down with me every day after school and you're going to learn computer science and coding. And I was like, well, coding, like, what is this? Yeah. Actually, you know what? I found it super therapeutic, man. I properly enjoyed it. And since, since I took a focus on studying, I flipped. I was getting like D's and E's and stuff. And then I managed to flip that in GCSEs to two A stars, six A's of B and a C, which is mm. not bad. Mm-hmm. And then I started, I started enjoying some of the stuff I was studying. I, oftentimes I, I didn't do well because I, I used to ask why a lot. Like, why am I doing this? What's the point? Where is this leading to? Mm. Actually, when I was in year 12, I wanted to study psychology at uni. I didn't even want to do um, mm. computing. An actual fact, had my teacher had predicted me an A grade at A2, I probably would have gone on to apply for psychology and not even done uh, compute, computer science. Mm. Uh, I did computing for A levels. And I was always good at it, but again, it was building solutions, learning how to build solutions, but with no sense of purpose. And so I kind of started enjoying building products. And so I built a product for as part of a coursework um, in AS, and I was like, actually, you know what? Computing's quite nice. I was always good at maths, mm. uh, but you know, I never really s- studied for the sake of studying. I like for with maths, for example, I used to study the past papers. I never went into the textbooks um, because the end goal for studying or what we what I was taught to study for was to get good grades so you can go to university. So I was like, okay, if the end or the first order principles get good grades, then what's the path to get good grades? Mm. Know the exams and coursework. Okay, what's the quickest time I can know the exam and coursework? For maths, I just studied all the past papers. And so <clears throat> I noticed that every second year was basically the same types of questions, just using different numbers. And if you could learn the core concepts of that, you're nine times out of 10 more likely to achieve a not phenomenal grade. So I, I got an A star for A levels in maths. Amazing, um, amazing. And yeah, that's what I did. Mm. and that's that's a really really interesting story because i suppose that there probably would be an assumption that like someone doing computer science would have always wanted to do computer science or would i'd always be really interested in it so i think it's super interesting that you actually at some point had never thought about that and was initially quite reluctant to do it um so i suppose the question then is if you'd done psychology for example at university would that have changed your path dramatically do you think or, or not really? Ah, oh, man. You know what? My path started after university. Even in university, I had no sense of purpose. I was this, you know, I didn't see myself as, as smart in the <clears throat> technical terms. You know, I don't think I have a high IQ. Mm. And so, the first time I got into university and I was like, I don't really fit in here. Mm. Everyone's so different. Everyone wanted to be this lawyer or this accountant or work for Facebook and Google and you know, I managed to get an internship in JP Morgan and I hated it. I hated it so much. Mm-hmm. And I'm grateful. They were like, I remember this one woman in, when I was in JP Morgan. I, I'm not going to bait out her name, but <laughs> she was like, <laughs> she was like, you'll never, you will never be good here. Like you will never have an offer here. Mm. And when I was six, six, six or eight weeks in, like, no, you've got no chance. Mm. Um, was, was this it? Was this a, so? This was a, for the viewers watching. This was a summer internship. Summer internship in my third year. In your third year, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, and so I did a four-year course. I did uh, MN uh, computer science. Yeah, in my third year, yeah, I did, JP Morgan did an internship and just hated it. 
I just really didn't enjoy it. It just wasn't for me. Mm. I felt like a cog in a big machine. Mm. And I, I felt like I wasn't really appreciated. And I, honestly, I was given quite unchallenging work, which again, I never really even did it. I kind of blagged my way each week saying, oh, I'm researching this and researching that, but I never really did anything. And mm. the point was that I didn't have a sense of purpose. Like, what was my why behind it? And, you know, I was, our family was struggling a lot when I was going through university financially. Um, and we went through real hard times. Um, and so I was studying a lot on, and my mental health was all over the place. I was studying a lot on uh, positivity, happiness, mindfulness. And then I was like, I always felt like a bum and I'd been quite lucky. Like I got, I got lucky getting into UCL. The truth is in UCL, I cheated in my interview process. Um, I found out who was interviewing me and then I Googled his name. He, the, the interviewer had written a book on encryption. Mm. I downloaded the PDF version of the book on my phone. I read the first page of every chapter. And then when I went into the interview, I was like, he was like, oh, what do you enjoy? I was like, I love encryption. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm a big fan of encryption. You know, I read this piece by this person. Oh, snap, you're the, you're the interview on the author. Oh, my, hey, I'm a fan. And oh, we got on it. I knew, I, knew the, I knew the interview time was like 15 minutes. I knew if I could blag my way for 15 minutes, he mm. wouldn't ask me questions. Mm. Um, and so... Yeah, I ended up blagging my way through it and we just conversated and we were talking about football and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I knew in the time limit, okay, if I can make him feel good about me, he'll, he'll nine times out of ten put me through. And so that's what I ended up doing. And mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> it worked. But, you know, I went into university and again, same shit, like in computer mm -hmm. science, I'm learning like theories and I'm learning Java and I'm learning a program without a proof of concept to put it on. And, Oftentimes, my favorite classes were all the were, were courses such as like entrepreneurship and yeah. some different types of maths problems and problem solving because I enjoyed maths. Mm. Um, ultimately, I enjoyed problem solving, but there's no point doing problem solving stuff if you haven't got a purpose to solve for. And so, after I've completely flopped, uh, uh, well, I didn't get through for the JP Morgan inf internship, thankfully, um, and since then, I just started, you know, studying, like, who, what even makes a successful person? Like, what is in his success? Like, I felt like a bum my whole life. Mm. Um, you know, I think that came from an early age when I got bullied. I got bullied in primary school. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, man, it's through that, the times of, it was through all those hardships where I've been able to try and build myself to this point where I see problems and I now have different types of playbooks I'll use to help solve those problems. Mm -hmm. Whether that be personal problems at home or professional, but look, I ain't perfect. I make mistakes all the time. Um, yeah. But I, but I think all of that is super refreshing because there will be people watching that will be able to relate. Like they would, they would have maybe been bullied or, or gone through something difficult. So to see someone like you that's gone on to great success, I think, for them, it would be super important to kind of have that role model. Uh, and actually, I think you're pretty humble because I don't think um, you cheated that interview. I think you, you're super creative. And I think more and more people should be thinking outside the box because clearly, if you know that the interview maybe will favour some people that potentially are more technical in, in one way or the other, you actually use your, your, maybe your core strength in a way of being creative, thinking outside the box, basically problem solving, essentially, and, and getting yeah. yourself think, back to you. So that's great. I think, you know what, it's always because of, life's always, we even grown up, been, I've had really great parents who have tried to give me everything they wanted, but, you know, I had a slightly hardish upbringing in terms of I got bullied in school and, you know, my parents went through a lot of financial difficulties and just to keep it real on your podcast, we went to court like eight times in 2014, I think it was, 2013, 2013 or 2014, and my family went near bankruptcy. So, um, you know, while I'm going through these tr struggles and troubles, I'm trying to build a, build a startup here. Yeah. So I, but I always had that sense of purpose. Like my mum had worked so hard in her life, touch wood in five years, her, our wider family, some of my friends' families never have to work a day in their lives again. If things go incredibly well. Um, but 
to, to to relate it back to your question, I've always been in big problems where it's this deadline or you either sort this by this time or we're going to take your house away. Or do you know what I mean? So it's through these big problems. I look at work now and I'm like, there's always a solution. And so we applied that in Lingumi throughout. And, you know, the business has reached near um, death experiences. Uh, we nearly went bankrupt. We nearly ran out of complete cash last year when we were struggling to find product market fit. Mm. You know, we, in the first nine months of the business, things were going great. And what was phenomenal was because everyone doubted us. And I've always been in a position where everyone has doubted me. Mm. So I'm like, I get turned on by these situations. I'm like, bring it on. Mm. And so, you know, the first nine months, we had great traction. We raised a pre-seed run from pitch to investment in 10 weeks. Mm. We, thought, we thought we had found product market fit, but we were deluded because product market fit is not a solution. Product market fit is a process. Mm. Just like how markets consistently develop. And if we don't stay on top of it, continue validating our hypotheses, then we're doomed to fail. Mm. Anyways, we're jumping forward. So uh, <laughs> I'll save that. <laughs> No, 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 no. It's, it's really, really powerful stuff. Um, like there's, there's lots of key messages there. And I, I, and I really, I really think people will find it powerful because it is for you to have gone through that stuff for most people, just having a full-time job would be challenging enough having all of that stuff happening in the background, but you left university and transitioned into starting your own company. So I didn't even want to, man. Like I, I did and I didn't like EF came. So, so entrepreneur first. So like, yeah, I'm in, yeah, I'm in fourth year university now. Um, I haven't got, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, shit, man, what am I going to do after university? Like a lot of people have had internships and got the job and, you know, people are going to banks and consultancies and da 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 da, da. And I was like, what am I going to do? I stumbled across uh, trading. Not like how it's done now. Um, I was looking into like algo trading. It was something about maths and problem solving. I was like, yeah, let's do it. But as I, as I went more deeper into the topic, the subject area, I was like, again, what's my sense of purpose? For me to build a company that impacts the next billion users, I've got to be willing to graft for 10, 15, 20 years to make a huge impact. Often, often you know, I saw people getting jobs. I'm like, you're thinking so short term. Mm. And in my head, I was like, in order to get to what I define as success, more, more financial success for my family, I'm going to need to graft 10, 15, 20 years at something. Anyway, so in, in my fourth year, I had, there was no options, no internships, no nothing. I was like, shit, what am I going to do? And then I got, uh, shout out Zoe. Zoe from EF, she's at EQT Ventures now. Uh, Zoe Hewitt. She, she sent me a message on LinkedIn saying, EF, why don't you start here? Why don't you come join the EF? Da, 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 da. Mm. I was like, no, nah, not for me. She was like, oh, get, get, that just talked to me. I never thought about building a business. I never thought about building a business because my mum's, her own business was struggling. Like I said, uh, we needed yeah. to bank. So that, so that kind of really impacted your like, perception of the whole start. I never wanted, yeah. yeah, I never wanted yeah. to run a business in, in my life. I saw mm. the stresses and struggles my mum was going through. I was like, no, nah, fuck this. Mm. I'm not on it. Um, you know, my mum had gone through a lot. Bless her. She's, she, people talk about inspiration. My mum's a real inspiration. Um, she came to this country of 50p. She was walking around barefoot. Um, she made, she met, put money in a business. She lost all that money. She started another business, made money. We ended up getting frauded and whatnot. And, and a lot of money had, had gone. And so I was like, I'm not really on it. Mm. Um, but then... The more I started studying successful people, the more I was like, what have I really got to lose here? But then, okay, so I'm in, I'm in the EF interviews. I'm like, all right, cool, I'll give it a shot. Um, let's see how it goes. And then I was, but I was fully fixated on trading. I remember I wanted to build this solution uh, around the problem statement that 90% of retail traders lose 90% of their money within 90 days. I kind of built a, a, a really shitty dissertation around that. Um, and then I got in the interviews. Now, EF was EF said you could bring the world at that time. You could bring really smart technical graduates. In my head, I'm like, I'm not that technical. 
I'm not that smart. Why am I even here? Mm. And so they were like, bring a solution. Now, I remember I stupidly paid a thousand pound in, in my fourth year for a uh, trading course. I don't know. I kind of loved learning for things that I wanted to learn rather than things I was forced to be made to learn. Mm. Uh, and so, one second. Yeah, I did this course and um, I brought the EF were like, bring, uh, you have to bring a technical solution to you to the next interview and showcase it. <laughs> so this course downloaded loads of spreadsheets. Uh, it gave me loads of spreadsheets on uh, different uh, currency rates mapped against stocks and whatnot. I was like, yeah, I'm really into trading. I built these spreadsheets. Look at this. Da, 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 da. And I kind of gave it that um, big talk and, and I believed I made it. So it helped them believe that I made it. They're like, yeah, cool. You got in. And then it came to the last stage. I was like, oh shit. It was like a 40, it was like a 24 hour hackathon. And I'm there and I'm there and I'm thinking, raw. Um, what am I gonna do? Everyone here is mad technical. Everyone here is super smart. Oxford, Cambridge. Da, 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 da. I'm thinking, shit. I'm just a guy from Ilford <laughs> that, <laughs> that went that luckily got into UCL that hasn't got these like incredible grades and, and done all these things that these people have done. They're mm. talking about machine learning and da, 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 da. And me machine learning. I was like, oh, yeah. So you know, I did, I, did, I, I sat there and I got put in a team and we're trying to build this solution and. Man, I had no idea what I was doing, but I kept trying and trying and trying. I didn't sleep. I kept Googling solutions, trying, trying, trying. And then it got to the last, it got to, we were leaving. I hadn't really done much. And I walked past Matt Clifford. He was like, you're right. I was like, yeah, I'm just gutted, man. I was like, I know I can crack this, but I didn't do it in the time. I was like, I know I can do it. I know I can do it. And I was like, okay, I, I definitely didn't get into EF. I was like, fuck it, I'll try applying for different things. So I started applying and not really put my head into it, not really caring or thinking about it. And then I was in a maths class and I got a call. I was like, oh shit, let me take it. So I walked out of the class, I took the call and it was Alice Bintik. And I remember she told me that day, she was like, Adit, we, made a, we had a really tough decision with you. Either you're someone who's going to really make it or you're someone who's going to be a complete failure. We're going to take that risk on you. So for the first hour, I was like, yeah, fucking have it. I got in. And da, da, da. then I was like, oh, shit, I'm not that technical. I'm joining a, a program. Here we go again. What am I going to do? <laughs> and I was thinking, shit, I've got to pair up with a co-founder. And da, 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 da. Anyway, so maths had finished. Uh, you know, the joy of ear thinking, yeah. Then I started doubting myself. I was like, no, nah, there's no way I can do this. And then one of my good friends, Vinay, I, I met up with him and I was sitting with him in a park and I was like, and we were having some MS meal deals. And I was kind of like, bro, I don't think I can do this, man. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know what? Just give it a try, man. Mm -hmm. What have you got to lose? Mm -hmm. I was like, bro, man, I feel like a fraud. I frauded my way through the interview processes. Like, I don't know what they're seeing in me. It was like, nah, just, just give it one shot in it. Then on top of that, okay, so fast forward, we're, we're starting EF, and I'd spoken to my co-founder, Toby, a few times uh, in the interview process. But before EF, we were thinking, we were like, okay, let's, let's work together. Um, and we had a kickoff weekend to kind of stem that. Um, and, you know, I'd started studying loads of books on um, startups and happiness and positivity and growth and success. And I knew fuck all about startups. All I'd seen was businesses grow and fail like, like my mom's. And so I really had to study this game, man. I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it properly. And, yes, yeah, so I met Toby in the interview processes and we decided to discuss ideas. And even EF were against us working together. EF were like, go pair up with someone technical. Why are you building an English platform for kids in the UK? It's never going to work. But remember, these times I'd already been put into loads of situations where people told me, you can't do anything. You, yeah, you can't do this. Yeah, yeah. So when we came together, 
we were like, boom, we, we have to get consistent results. We have to get traction. I was going to split us up. And that's what we did, man. On day one, we sold a product that didn't even exist to, to a friend of a friend of mine for like eight pounds. I was like, rah, someone paid me for this and I haven't even built it. <laughs> it's just an idea. We're just talking about building this English solution. And, you know, a few weeks went in and we were like, okay, like we need to prove that this works. So we ended up, <laughs> we tried building this prototype. Again, I'm not that technical. So I'm figuring out how to build the technical pieces and some solutions and, we were three hours away from seeing a prospective customer and nothing worked. I was like, shit, man, what are we going to do? And they were like, okay, hang on a minute. We've got three hours. Why don't we try and mimic this software? Why don't we create a PowerPoint that mimics the software? And when a child does something, we will change it from our phones. We we're like, will that gain the same output? Yeah. And it was super interesting because I was like, uh, we, Toby and I went, so Toby's my co-founder. Um, we went into this uh, parent's house and we set up this software for their child. And oftentimes we were thinking, right, we're testing with UK children. How do we test that the solution works? So let's test other languages. So I remember we had, there were pictures and every time a child touched the screen per se, the, the screen would change. And so it showed a picture of a, uh, I can't remember the English term, but it was, I think it was a cow. And the French term for cow, I think, is vache. And so this little kid, he saw it and he said, vache. I was like, okay, cool. We came back three weeks later. We showed him the picture. This little kid that had no exposure to English, uh, to, to French, said vache. And I was like, fuck, you know, I think we're onto something. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then, yeah, man, we just started working together. So, you know, so many people doubted us, even when we were in the beginning, um, especially EF cohort members, because they all came with Oxford. Da, da, da. And my co-founder from Oxford as well, but what's amazing about Toby, which I love him to bits on, is he's super humble and he's super mission driven. And we connected on that way. You see, I had never really met someone that had thought differently as I did. I often, in, even in university, thought I was a bit of a weird person. I think so differently and da, 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 da. everyone wants his jobs. I'm not even feeling it. And I, came, I met Toby and I was like, yeah, this, I get this good energy from you. Uh, and at, at the beginning, there's an article online on this, but he didn't like me at the beginning. I often, I spoke a big game, changed the world, um, a billion user systems, da, 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 da. And he's like, okay, realistic. So. You know, we put our relationship to the test, and man, in first, three, I think it was from month three to month six, I made thirty-four app releases. Um, we would see customers day in, day out. Uh, we would work sixteen, seventeen-hour days, Monday to Friday. Work on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, it was relentless. But would I do it again? No fucking way. Often people think hard work is the hours you put in. Hard work is the output you produce from the hours you put in. At least for, for, for my definition. Mm. Uh, other people define it differently. Mm. Um, and so we do things. If, I, if we were to start Lingumi again, we do things so differently. We'd had no sense of strategy. We, had, um, we brought in a marketing team before we had product market fit. Uh, we were spending, we got tied up in, in, in performance ads and, and performance marketing. And we're making money from that. But we, and once we found what we thought we found product market fit, we thought it was a solution rather than a process. So after we raised our pre-seed round, we barely even experimented with customers. And for years this went on. And then we we realized when we were completely up against it and we had a few months of runway left, we've got to try and make it happen. What what made us so successful in the beginning days that caused us to like <laughs> quite frankly flop for, for a number of years and uh yeah that's when we started studying who we were and i started moving myself more into the people and culture space and understanding how can we build a a phenomenal culture that drives great results often you hear culture strategy for breakfast but you don't know what culture to even build without having the right strategy in place mm -hmm. so 
yeah, all of these earnings. Sorry, I've been jumping like left and right, left and right. No, no, no. no like I think I think it all, it all really relates, and I, and it it gives a really nice picture as to how LinkedIn even started and the whole. I think a lot of people don't see this side of entrepreneurship. They see this the whole, you know, oh, we sit around the table, we have one idea, we run with it, we get investment, and we grow. But clearly, oh from your experience, actually, the nitty gritty can be quite tough. So let's just just for the viewers though, um, I think, yeah. just give like a quick explanation as to what actually is Ling Lingumi, just in case some people haven't heard of it. Yeah, sure. So what Lingumi is is we provide the world's best teaching experience to preschool children all around the world through technology. Uh, we've started with our first course, which is from Teacher Toby. Teacher Toby is also my co-founder, <laughs> ACO, and also the CEO, and also the first uh, teacher in the in the uh, uh, platform now. But well, platform it, it's becoming a flat platform, but currently we're still in that. Mm. Uh, we get children speaking from day one. Um, we have really strong retention metrics. I don't know the exact number, um, so I'm not gonna. Uh, give it in case I'm wrong um, but you know Toby, Toby often says we have great retention numbers um, mm. and so do our investors mm. but for us I think it's providing the critical skills to children that really need it ones that aren't able to afford means to great education uh, you know a, a private tutor costs anywhere from 30 to 50 pound an hour and actually we're quite lucky to even be communicating here and you know the way we communicate, often people think technology changes the world. I'm not, technology is a means to change the world, right? But on Zoom, we're communicating through our body language, the critical skills we've learned from toddler, from being a toddler. Mm. So actually, how can we teach these critical skills um, at an age which is inappropriate? Uh, and so the best age for children to learn a language um, are two to six year olds because they have um, huge amounts of neuroplasticity in their brain. But as the years go on, this neuroplasticity decreases. Mm -hmm. So it becomes harder and harder to, to learn um, languages and other critical skills. And mm -hmm. so this year we'll be developing uh, new courses on reading and writing. We're bringing on a new teacher. Uh, we've scaled the team from 10 people in December to 29 people from Monday. Amazing. Um, and I think it's because we place huge, huge emphasis on our people and building a, a, a thriving culture. You know, um, culture for us, culture is often this gooey thing. People talk about having this great culture, but can't even define what culture is. Mm. It's, people talk about, oh, I'm a great, we have great leadership but can't even define what the core principles of leadership even are. So I did a lot of research into what even is culture. Um, and for me, it's the, the definition I like to use um, that I've come up with is uh, the environment we create that allows the uh, behaviors individuals. Yeah. So it's the environment that we create um, that enables the behaviors we deem necessary um, to go on to achieve our company mission or strategy. And so if we look at that, what is the environment we're creating and what are the behaviors that we need to see from our people and characteristics to help us um, move towards our, our mission. And so we hire people based on five core characteristics. Uh, are you mission driven? Are you hardworking? Are you smart? Are you humble? And are you authentic? Now, when I talk about smart, I don't mean, do you have a high IQ? I mean, are you intellectually curious? Do you have a growth mindset? And do you present really complicated things in really simple and elegant ways? Take Albert Einstein. Mm. Einstein was never the greatest physician, but he was the smartest one because he could take such complicated matters and turn it into really simple um, explanation ways. You know, take, uh, take Google's founders. Uh, you know, I, I've, I was reading this book and there was a, there was a company that was existed, <clears throat> that existed before them uh, and during the, the, the early years of their tenure. And they had hundreds of millions of finance backing. They were valued at a billion plus. Uh, and <laughs> these Google guys just came in and was like, and they stuck on a fridge, uh, ads suck. <laughs> we're gonna solve ads. Um, and, you know, these two quite geeky people just 
not that much backing just were like hey we're just going to solve this really shitty problem that people face just make the best experience out of it mm -hmm. and often you know that's what building great solutions are if we think about it. it's taking taking a problem that a user is deeply facing or seeing a solution that loads of people use but it's not really that good and just consistently working with them to build something that is genuinely phenomenal i think ideas are cheap um i learned that from alice bintic uh from ef uh you know if i often think when people want to talk to me about their ideas and they're like send me an nda i'm like hmm a bit suspicious because often even we found what we started with you know, we were a learning app which had some sets of English games on there. As the traction has grown, as we found more elements of product market fit, the vision and mission has also grown. Mm -hmm. You know, the aim is in the next 10 to 15 years to empower and influence the next 500 million children around the world. Uh, I'm a founder that is naive to think in 15 years I can build a company bigger than Disney. Um, and but having those endpoints, and if we bring about really smart people that have the same core characteristics, but come from completely different walks of life, uh, then I think, I think we'll be able to do it. But there's going to be loads of challenges. Again, we nearly died last year. We'll probably nearly die another three, four times. Mm. Um, but it's knowing, I heard some great piece of advice recently uh, from, I think it was Jim Dethmer, as a podcast I listened to on Farnham Street. Uh, there is no success without failure. You can't have big successes without big fuck ups. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but often people think, you know, and it's so funny because people think to build uh, uh, a business, let's focus on the website and the fonts and the text and what we're going to offer and da 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 da. Mm -hmm. But no, like that shit don't matter. Like customers really don't give a shit about you. Like mm -hmm. you're, we're a small fish in a big pond. Mm -hmm. we just, what worked for us. And it'll be different from other people, but I try not to give advice, but speak from experience. Because I think advice is, you know, how can you give advice if you've never experienced it? So like, from our experience, what we found worked in the early days and is working now is working with those sets of users that really love your product. Um, as you grow in scale, of course, you deal with different users. We deal with different user segments, but <clears throat> in the initial days, it was always dealing with 10 users who loved our shit. And we were going to the houses like every day, one customer per day. Um, we'd travel from Putney to Leytonstone because what was interesting was watching our users use our products. And I had another interesting bit of advice in the early days. Um, and I'm still quite micromanaging, to be honest. I'm not perfect, but um, when we were looking at, when we were testing this product with a customer, I was like, no, no, do this, do that. She was like, add it, I'm gonna tell you once, and once only, shut up and let me, let me use it. And actually, it's weird, because you see this person not using your baby properly, you know. And and like, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that, that kind of stuck through, which is like, if you built something shitty, great. Mm. Because if your users are still wanting to use it and see the general concept, I think we're onto something. And so I guess that's what we found, man. And we focused on just building products which users love. We made mistakes along the way in terms of, you know, I only thought, based on where I was from, I was like, yeah, have people which are super mission driven and that's all you need mm. to, to build and scale this business. Well, no, it's, it's the fun, foundational core of what we need, but it's not just what we need. Mm -hmm. We also need people who are hardworking in terms of generating great output from the hours they put in. We need people who are smart, so people who are intellectually curious. We need people who are um, authentic and humble. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are, the, those are the five core characteristics which every individual has to have at Lingoon. Mm -hmm. If someone has four out of five, they will not be part of the organization because it just won't work. The magic doesn't happen. Mm. And we found that you can be those five things, but still be very different in the way you think, who you are. Remember me and Toby come from completely different walks of life. Mm. And it's why we focused on hiring in other areas because you know we've got offices in London, Cardiff, Shenzhen, and Singapore. We collectively speak over eight or 10, eight, eight or 10 languages. 
but I love my people. Do you know what I mean? Like they are so talented and they've all come together on this mission and they all see Lingumi as their own. And for us, you know, nine months ago when we were, we were struggling, we had to come out, find our way, otherwise we would have died. Our culture was really shown when the going went fucking tough and everyone doubled down and it showed they cared. They cared. And so, you know, that's why we, it, Marty Kagan talks about this a lot, but we decided to hire missionaries over mercenaries. You know, you mm. can be phenomenally great at something, but if you don't care about the mission, you're not going to stick around when the going gets tough. Mm. Mm. So, such powerful stuff there. And, and you know, just, just to get the viewers, you know, some, some great stats as to how well you guys are doing. You know, you've scaled into multiple countries, taught over 5 million English lessons already, you know, raised over 6 million pounds from some incredible investors, local globe, ADB. So, you know, some incredible success. I suppose then, to, just to conclude then, Adit, what would you say for someone looking, thinking about starting their own business? What, what's the most important? important thing that they really need to think on because I know you've touched upon a few things but if you had to kind of sum it into one thing is it you know having a, you know asking yourself why all the time or having that that core purpose what what's the kind of key thing I know the, to summarize but what's the actual question what like you know you've had all of this success you know what would you say for other young entrepreneurs watching this you know what's your key piece of advice like the main thing that you think young entrepreneurs should do based on what you've lived and you've experienced to, to kind of grow a business uh advice is cheap what would i guess i'll frame that as what would i tell my younger self if i was thinking about starting something mm, okay yeah <clears throat> i would tell myself don't start something unless you're super passionate about it Mm, passion. about really making an impact in this world you know i mm. i genuinely believe the world will be a better place with lingumi in it mm. um it's mm. why i work why the whole team works so hard because we all believe that lingumi should exist in this world yeah um because it helps develop the critical skills that every child needs in a fair and accessible and affordable way mm. um so yeah, I don't know, man. Like, it's very hard because I would never be a person that would start the next Uber or start the next Deliveroo or start. Mm. Mm. These are all menial things for me. Like, they're all based on technology. And for me, it's all about building businesses that not only make a social impact, but also make a profit. <laughs> like, mm. we're not a charity. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I think you can, I think we can, I think companies can tie definitely tie the two together you know and look we've we've just paired with the global fund for children like we can't do this by ourselves mm. um and so we we know that there are still children that exist in this day and age that don't even have access to educational resources or even a strong internet connection or an internet connection at all sure. so mm -hmm. there are companies who we'll be pairing with who, who we have done like the global fund for children to help us yeah man really really make a change in this world Mm, and that that passion and that impact and I, and I think a lot of people watching will think you know what like let's be honest with myself if I don't have that passion as, as you've talked about a lot of hard work a lot of grit a lot of downs as much as ups so so well, yeah I'll tell you one thing mm. if I didn't start Lingumi I would work for Lingumi I love the people I love the mission like mm. Now, often media portrays founders in, oh, they're the limelight, da, 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 da. But without my people, mm. we would never have got to where we've got to. Mm. And without bringing on more phenomenal people, mm. we're never going to get to that point the next in, day. in a pass yeah. away. Yeah. And so, you know, often we're the idea people and we, we love generating ideas, but as, you, as we've grown our stuff, Toby, my role, mine and Toby's roles are, are changing. We're moving from actual doers to facilitators and coaches. Mm. Right? and how do we let go of our legos how do we build people who are better than us effectively to make ourselves redundant right mm. um, because lingumi is bigger than you or i it's bigger mm. than any individual person in the company um so as long as i can do my part for it uh then we'll be moving forward in the right direction so mm. you know after this startup who knows i might start up if things go well, I might start a fund. If things go really badly, I might join a company. 
there's loads of options. I, yeah. I would like to, in my lifetime, write a couple of books as well. Mm. Um, mm. I think, you know, often if, if I think if there was advice, if you're not the passionate one, go find someone who is and understand what your core superpower is. My, my, from what I've found, my superpower is taking near impossible challenges and accomplishing it in some way, shape or form. Um, while being able to motivate a team to try and try and get there. That's what I found. Now, in two years, that might be completely different. Mm. Um, and, you know, I've still got loads of improvements to make. Like, I still micromanage sometimes. Um, if, a, like, if someone new has joined and they haven't done good work, sometimes my body language will, will show that. And I'm not, that em I'm not as empathetic as I should be. So having realized this, thanks to my co-founder actually um people sometimes find it hard to give me feedback but thanks to my co-founder um he, and even he does by the way um i'm looking now for an exec coach to try and try and help me along that remit um, mm -hmm. i think back to your question though i think understanding what your superpowers are and then if you're not the person to come up with a deep mission where the business can outlast you join a company that will outlast its leaders Mm. Mm. yeah yeah i mean your story is, is yeah is really really thought-provoking i think a lot of people watching this will will have a lot of takeaways um and it's really raw and really refreshing and one of the things <laughs> I've, one of the things i've always loved about you is you do keep it really raw and you you do you say it as it needs to be said i think a lot of a lot of people like sit in interviews with founders and and kind of don't really get the truth so i, I really like I really like how honest that I think it's not about what in I think there's a difference it's not about what needs to be said mm. it's about what is happening what and is I think happening? often mm. often uh, I could rant about this all day but the they are the Forbes 30 under 30s list for example mm. they pick leaders who have written the most on LinkedIn mm. often you know the, you see so many founders just put on this mask saying i'm this leader and i've done this and i've done that and yada 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 and it's like bro like you paint a perfect world when we all know you, your business is failing it's not the reality like, come yeah. on like mm -hmm. and i think oftentimes people use their titles for granted mm -hmm. um there's a lot of fucked up shit in this startup world um and there's a lot of founders that put it on Mm. And I'm sure we could have another conversation or rant on this, but you know, like I don't like the startup world. I'll be real with you, man. Like I don't, I don't really network. I don't really talk to that many other founders other than through the LG group because they're all companies that are making a social impact. Mm. Um, so yeah, oftentimes I think founders should be real with themselves so they can be real with their team members. They need to be we need to be compassionate towards ourselves so we can be compassionate to our people. Like mental health is a big thing. Don't get it twisted. And often founders portray this thing like, yeah, I'll work 5 a.m. in the morning and I'll go till 9 p.m. And bro, that's not sustainable. Get out of here. You have founders that rock, not to be rude yeah, but <clears throat> people like Robin Sharma who have this 5 a.m. club and you often see motivational speakers, get up at 5 a.m. in the morning every day. Like, bro, that's not sustainable. If you're, you, you're, you're so short-minded by thinking these types of ways, like, we're in a marathon, not sprint here. So settle yourself, man. Like, why are you, why are you making people feel that this is the way to do it? Like, mm. success is no one shape or fucking form. Mm. I think success is really about being <clears throat> your one true self and holding your values close to you. Success is being able to come home to your family for fucking dinner. Um, mm. It's beyond work. Mm. So, yeah, man, I just, I don't know, man. I think most founders just need to get their heads out of their asses and just mm. speak, speak from how things actually are rather than this perception. And, you know, I'm releasing this culture doc next week um, after one of our designers has, has made it feel on brand and on point. Uh, which is going to give people a real understanding of who we are. You know, the best authors I've read are people like Ben Horowitz. They give you the raw fucking details, how it is. Mm. Not some bullshit facade that 
we started off in one idea and it grew to some hockey stick. Yeah, that might be true in one in a million companies. Yeah. What about the other companies that have gone on to success? Mm. Shop of uh, Spotify, uh, they, I'm going to listen to this uh, podcast later today on their history. Spoke about, they never got rocky shit traction. They just got consistent lineal growth and some moments of climbs. So, yeah, man, I feel, I just feel like public people often get swayed towards one direction when it is not the case. And I'll give you the reality checks here. Mm. Awards. Founders often say, yeah, we won this award. Bro, you had to pay to go to your own award ceremony. Let's get one thing right. <laughs> right? You're on this Forbes list. Yeah, because you tweet, you tweet the most and you write the most on LinkedIn. Mm. Um, mm. You know, I think the numbers, the numbers don't lie. Like, show the numbers. Don't show the claims behind it. Oh, we, we've built a great culture. Okay, what does that even mean? Uh, so, yeah, little rant done. <laughs> no, but I think, I, I, really, I really do think that there will, there will be, of course, there's always going to be people that disagree, but I think a, a majority of people watching will really, will really resonate. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I don't want to be, re, like, repeat myself, but it is, it is really powerful. Okay, so... Just, just to finish then, so um, obviously we're in lockdown and it, it, and it is the lockdown video cast podcast. <laughs> I'm just going to paint a scenario for you. So imagine Adit, Adit gets dropped on an island. Yeah. What are the three things that you would take and why? And they, and they can't be like, um, well, actually, they can be anything, but like they, it has to be three actual physical things kind of thing, if that makes sense. People can't or not? Yeah, but you can only take, uh, but, but one person is one thing, if that makes sense, out of the three. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I take my mum, mm. my dad, and my girlfriend, man. Um, really? Okay. Oftentimes, you know, I think if we were dropped on an island and there were big problems, my brain would just try and get to work and, you know. Uh, to get that, I, there'd be loads of people. There've been loads of influential people in my life, man. Even my co-founder is a big inspiration to me. Mm. He is a very calm, thoughtful leader. Like I learn so much from him. Um, oftentimes, I hold people accountable and I get results, but it's at the detriment of others sometimes. Mm. Um, you know, and this is where different cultures play trust, right? I'm quite direct. I'm quite candid. So some countries aren't like that at all, and so. I'm trying to develop my EQ skills in, in understanding how we, um, <clears throat> how we get the best out of our people, even though they come from different co countries and have different cultural nuances. Mm -hmm. You know, I would, I've learned loads from Joe White. He was the founder of Moonfruit. He was our uh, kind of mentor in EF. He was phenomenal. I built an amazing personal and professional relationship with him. I remember once was, something happened at home and he was at one point, he was like, look, I can loan you some money to help. And I didn't take it in the end. But knowing that he genuinely cared for me beyond Lingumi, I think I rate Alice Bintik. You know, she took a fucking big punt on me. Mm. And Lingumi has changed my life for the better. I can pay the, help pay the bills and support my family in, in ways I could never have thought I could have before. Mm. Um, I, I'm inspired by my mum. I'm inspired by the people around me. Like, mm. But I'm also inspired by... You know, people often talk about physical mentors. I don't think we need physical mentors. I think, like, I've been reading a lot of stuff from John Maxwell recently, um, who's a, a, a leadership coach, understands the core concepts of leadership. Ben Horowitz, uh, Patty McCord. Um, you know, so I think we can draw inspirations from, from people actually really close to us. Mm -hmm. um, just because they're not building that billion dollar startup, like, who gives a shit? Mm -hmm. like, People have real, like, this isn't the real world. This isn't real life. I'm, li I'm living in a bubble. Our business is growing so well when the whole world is fucking collapsing right now. Mm. Everyone in Lingumi feels like great. <laughs> unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, but it's not the real world. Most people have a nine to five. They come home, they prioritize their family. And actually, part of me is a bit jealous of that. Some mm. people have real great, you know, family connections and bonds and, and relationships with their, their partners and, and friends and whatnot. But yeah, man, I think we can take inspiration from. From, from the smaller things and just start people. to think outside the box of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, mum, dad, girlfriend. I think that's uh, a, di a different answer to what I've had, but uh, I'll be honest, some of the other people said like, 
iPhone and Fuck off. you know like coconuts and water but but now nah, I, I really like mum dad's girlfriend all right and it thank you very much mate really really appreciate it cool man have a good day thanks man <laughs>